Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our Backfighter Clean Summit 2019 Part 1. Um, it's so great to have you with us. We are taking on the subject of clean. It's a big topic, so we're doing it in two or maybe more webinars. Today, we're going to start with uh, hand washing and kitchen towels. This is Shelley Fife. I'm Executive Director of the Partnership for Food Safety Education, and we are very glad to have you with us. Next. Part two of the Clean Summit is going to be on June 12th, so please hold that date. And we'll say more about that later in the webinar. Next, please. The Partnership for Food Safety Education sponsors this webinar and a series of webinars throughout the year. We are a nonprofit, uh, and we develop and promote effective education programs to reduce foodborne illness risk for consumers. Our speakers today, we have some fantastic speakers, and uh, I, I, I'm very excited about some of what they're going to share with you today. Uh, David Verendas is with the CDC, um, the Waterborne Disease Prevention B Branch, and Dr. Akram Tamimi is with the University of Arizona. And again, I'm Shelley Fife. Welcome, and let's get started. A few housekeeping matters. We love, love, love to get your questions. So if you have a question for either of our speakers, would you please uh, use the function um, on the right uh, hand of your uh, webinar screen where it says questions. You can submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar. We will take questions at the end. And then after the webinar, you're going to get a brief survey Please fill it out. We look at all of that information. We take in your comments, and we always strive to improve. So fill out that survey, which will pop up as soon as the uh, webinar ends. Many of you earn CEUs by attending our webinars, which we love that. So here's how to get your CEU certificates. You can download the certificates right now from the handout functionality on this webinar. If you look at handouts, there are four listed. Three of those are CEU certificates, and one of them is uh, the clean fact sheet from fightback.org, which is our, one of our number, probably our number one download of all time. So I wanted to make sure you had that too. You can also, we'll also send out information about getting your certificate in the follow-up email. And once this webinar goes up on our webinar recordings page, the uh, certificates will be there also. So those are three great ways to get your certificate. If you do email us individually about getting them, we won't be able to uh, respond in a timely way. So please take note of how to get those uh, CEU certificates. Next, please. Today, we are going to cover some of the very fundamentals of cross-contamination. We're going to talk about hand washing, and we're going to talk about uh, kitchen and actually bathroom towels, and uh, I think get some very good information about cross-contamination from these sources. So we're going to launch a poll right now quickly. Um, in your line of work, how often do you address questions from consumers about cleaning practices and or hand washing? So we'd love to know, does this happen all the time? Uh, does it happen every so often? Or do you feel like you never get asked questions about cleaning, surface cleaning, or hand washing? Let's take uh, about 30 seconds for the poll. Please participate, and then we'll show you all the uh, responses.
So again, in your line of work, how often do you address questions from consumers? Um, this is not in your work situation, but just average consumers about cleaning practices or hand washing. Okay, thank you. All right, it sounds like you do get these questions and about a third of you say all the time and about 50% say every so often. Great, hopefully by the end of this webinar, you're going to have a little bit more background and more resources for addressing questions. Thanks for taking the poll. I wanted to just share, uh, because we're talking about a food safety and a home food safety context, uh, just some definitions that USDA uses about what is cross-contamination. Direct cross-contamination being contact between raw food and ready-to-eat food during transport, storage, or preparation. Uh, indirect cross-contamination being about the spread of bacteria from raw food to ready-to-eat food via food handlers, equipment, or surfaces. Next. And many of you, you do consumer education, none of this will surprise you, but there's, this is a little fun thing we can get going in the chat function. Um, cross-contamination at home, there's so many opportunities for cross-contamination. <laughs> So let's get our uh, creative hats on here. Um, we know wiping counters with a towel that's contaminated or wiping the counter with a towel and then using it to dry hands, not washing your hands after using the bathroom, handling food, handling pets, changing diapers, um, storing food improperly. Uh, an example of that might be storing raw food above ready to eat or you know raw meat or poultry that could uh, drip onto other foods, and then rinsing your raw poultry under running water in the sink. Um, this is something the CDC has got a lot of attention on lately, but people seem to want to do it. It's not a food safety step, and we do know it does um, lead to contamination in the sink and on the countertops. So if you've got a cross-contamination incident idea you'd like to share, please put that in chat, and we'll read some of those later. Next. You know, USDA has done some observational research recently, and we'll be talking about this much more in the second webinar in June, but some of these are the devices and items in the kitchen that are commonly contaminated um, because people are not washing their hands, or they're not properly washing the device or utensil, they're not properly cleaning or sanitizing, Count things like countertops, their towels and sponges, so these are the, some of the most commonly contaminated items and devices in the kitchen. Next. And here's a little bit uh, more information, uh, this research. When the slides go up, you'll be able to um, refer to these. But again, um, there's a lot more research now than there was just a couple of years ago on cross-contamination and on um, things like cell phones and devices, which the FDA recently looked at. So I urge you to look that up later. Next. Oh, God, that brings us to our first guest, um, David Berendis. He is with the Global Water Sanitation and Hygiene Team of the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. David Berendis is an interdisciplinary epidemiologist. He serves as a hand hygiene subject matter expert for both domestic and global settings. His research focuses on sanitation and hygiene associated exposures and their impact on health, as well as the increasing role of the environment in transmitting antibiotic resistant organisms. He has a BS in cell and molecular, molecular biology from Duke University and both an MSPH in Global Epidemiology and a PhD in Environmental Health Sciences from Emory University. Thank you so much, David, for being with us to cover this extremely important topic for our educators. Thanks so much, Shelley. Um, 
So with that introduction, uh, I'll get started on talking a little bit about hand washing in, uh, in community settings, which is where I work a lot of and where how we divide things at CDC. Um, so most important message, of course, hand washing is the single most important way to prevent transmission of infectious diseases because so many diseases are transmitted contaminated hands. Next slide. So let's consider why hand washing is important. And there may be a number of reasons you think about this. Next slide. So hand washing with soap removes germs from hands and this prevents infections because germs basically get on hands from contaminated objects. People frequently touch their eyes, nose and mouth without even realizing it. Uh, germs can get onto the body through eyes, nose and mouth make us sick. Um, and unwashed hands get into food and drink when we prepare them or consume them. Um, and obviously germs can multiply on all sorts of uh, food and drink under certain conditions and make people sick. So germs from unwashed hands can move around everywhere. And uh, certainly that was a point of cross-contamination that Shelley brought up earlier. So overall, hand washing helps prevent diarrhea and respiratory infections. Next slide. And so another kind of impact of hand washing that it can prevent sickness, which reduces the amount of antibiotics that we need to use. Um, it's hand washing can prevent up 30% of diarrhea related sicknesses and about 20% of respiratory infections like colds. Um, and antibiotics are often prescribed unnecessarily for these health issues. So reducing the number of these infections by frequently washing hands helps prevent the overuse of antibiotics uh, which is one, a major contributor to antibiotic resistance around the world. Um, hand washing can also prevent people from getting sick with germs that are already resistant to antibiotics that may be difficult to treat. Next slide. So I have to go through, uh, I'm not contractually obligated, but I have to go, go through the five major steps that we talk about for proper hand washing um, at CDC. So first we talk about turning on the water and wetting your hands. Then lathering soap on the back suit, on your palms, next to your hands, around and under your fingernails, and between fingers, uh, rubbing and soaking them vigorously for 20 seconds, um, about the time needed to sing the happy birthday song twice. Uh, then rinse the hands using clean running water and drying them with a paper towel or air drying them if a dryer is available. Next slide. So there are a number of key times that we talk about washing hands um, to both protect yourself and to protect others. Um, to protect yourself from disease causing germs, some major times are when they're visibly soiled, um, after assisting someone else who uses the toilet or changes the diaper, after touching animals, before uh, preparing food and feeding yourself or others, after handling raw meat, after outdoor activities like yard work or sports where hands can become dirty, before touching your nose, uh, eyes, or mouth. And to protect others, we talk about the uh, importance of washing hands after using the toilet, but also um, washing hands before cooking or feeding another person and after coughing and sneezing during flu season, especially. Next slide. So there are many places where we may not have access to soap water, and at these times, hand sanitizers can be effective for killing germs that may be on our hands. Um, if you use a hand sanitizer, we want you to use one that contains at least 60% alcohol. Um, and you can make sure that it has at least 60% alcohol by reading the product label. Even if you've used a hand sanitizer, we want you to try and wash your hands with soap and water as soon as you can afterwards. Um, the reason for this is that there are important differences between washing hands with soap and water and cleaning them with hand sanitizer that I'll get to a little bit later. Um, hand sanitizer may not kill all germs. Uh, uh, especially one, certain ones that cause diarrhea. Hand sanitizers may also not remove harmful chemicals um, like pesticides or heavy metals. So that's why we recommend hand washing with soap and water when, if at all possible, in home and community settings like schools, workplaces, and restaurants. Um, importantly, we talk about not using hand sanitizer if hands are visibly dirty or greasy. For example, after playing outside or after fishing or camping, um, because hand sanitizer doesn't work that well when your hands are visibly soiled. Um, so if you can see your hands are dirty, I want you to wash your hands with soap and water. Next slide. 
When you do use hand sanitizers, um, you should use uh, enough to wet both hands completely. About a quarter size of hand sanitizer is usually enough to wet all hands, uh, all surfaces of both hands. Um, but you can also usually get that information on how much you need to use from the product label. After applying the sanitizer to your hands, rub it all over your hands, including the palms back between fingers and back of the hands, and rub until your hands feel dry, which usually may take about 20 seconds or so, but we don't want you to rinse or wipe off the hand sanitizer before it's dry. That's actually a very common problem that we see with people using hand sanitizer. Um, we want you to rub it until it's dry, and then you get the full effect of the germ killer. Next slide, please. So recently, some updates on what's come, uh, come out in terms of which soap to use. Uh, the FDA, FDA completed their final rules on the effectiveness of quote-unquote antibacterial and antiseptic hand soaps and sanitizers. Um, you may have seen this coming through over the last uh, six years, really. They started this process in 2013. Um, and the conclusions are essentially that Plain soaps or normal bar soap for soaps are just as good as any other soap that was out there that was previously marketed as antibacterial. Those so-called antibacterial and antiseptic additives um, like triclosan cannot be produced anymore added to soap because they weren't found to be any more effective than plain soap and water uh, in terms of removing germs. So. In consumer hand sanitizer and hand washing, uh, so soap, soaps for hand washing, uh, FDA has banned the uh, use of these additives in those products specifically. So you can use your plain soap just as much as, uh, as any other soap, and there should be no soap at this point that are marketed for consumers as antibacterial. Um, and then for hand sanitizer, again, 60% alcohol content. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about some of the scientific evidence uh, and the whys for why we have these recommendations, because we get a lot of questions and this can be really helpful in terms of educating the public on why we make certain recommendations. Next slide. So let's talk first about soap versus hand sanitizer. This is probably the question I get most often um, from people asking the CDC inbox uh, about hand hygiene. Um, so there are important differences between soap and hand sanitizers and what they're designed to do. Soap is designed for cleaning through the removal of contaminants from hands and surfaces. So the soap molecules bind to contaminants like dirt and grease um, and germs. And running water removes the soap and contaminants from our hands. Um, soap is generally not designed to kill microbes. Um, so we uh, so we're not thinking about killing the microbes. We're talking about thinking about more removing them. Hand sanitizers, on the other hand, are designed to kill germs by damaging them, but they don't really provide true cleaning in that they are not designed to physically remove contaminants from hands. Hand sanitizers containing at least 60% alcohol are best because the alcohol is an effective chemical for killing most germs with the exception of most stomach viruses, parasites, and some bacteria. Uh, dirt and grease can prote um, protect germs from contact with alcohol, which is why hand sanitizers are not as effective for killing germs on dirty or greasy hands. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate a few particular reasons when uh, situations when we don't suggest hand sanitizer use, um, Again, people ask us, well, why do we care if our hands are visibly dirty? Well, if our hands are visibly dirty, then the active ingre ingredients, the ethanol or isopropanol, the alcohol ingredient, can't get to the germs to kill them. So if it can't get to the germs to kill them, again, hand sanitizer is going to try to kill germs, not remove them, so it's not gonna be as effective. Why do we care about stomach bugs? Well, a few of the stick bugs and bugs that cause gastrointestinal illness like protozoa, non viruses, and a few other organisms, uh, are resistant to alcohol-based inactivation. So alcohol doesn't actually kill them, but they're not susceptible to it. So that's why we don't suggest using hand sanitizer in those, in those situations. And then given that hand sanitizer is designed to kill microbes rather than removing them, we also don't always know how it interacts with chemicals or grease or non-micro situations on your hands. 
So that's why we don't generally recommend it's used in those cases as well. Next slide. So thinking about our recommendations, a couple questions that we get very often. Why 20 seconds? <laughs> why do we say to wash your hands for 20 seconds specifically? Um, so there's some research out there that suggests that uh, washing hands for 15 to 30 seconds removes more germs than shorter times. And we're still constantly kind of looking to these questions of how long is long enough? Um, there's studies out there that show some reduction after 10 seconds, a little bit more after 15, a little bit more after 20, and then a little bit more after 30. After 30 to 40, you don't really see any uh, additional reductions, at least from the studies that we've seen so far. So we really don't recommend any beyond that. You certainly can if you want to, but thinking about practicality wise, we try to limit it to the shortest time that we think is gonna be effective. Um, the second question uh, is that we're often asked about, why don't you recommend using towels to turn off water taps, to touch door handles after we've washed our hands? So unfortunately, there's little scientific evidence to guide us on this question at this point. This is something that we're actively hoping to look at. Um, we also, because we are not just making recommendations to uh, restaurants or food, food um, handling situations specifically, we're working in community settings uh, nationwide, we know that not all bathrooms are equipped with uh, paper towels, perhaps, like the bathroom at home. Um, or bathrooms may be equipped with hand dryers. So if we're gonna make a recommendation that implies use of one technology like towels versus another, that could raise concerns for people about visiting facilities that are not equipped with that other type of technology. So we try to be general, but it is an area that we're actively collecting data on to try and see if we need to revise our recommendations in this situation. Next slide. Um, and finally, just some quick evidence, uh, fast facts sort of that I alluded to before of disease prevention through hand washing. Um, so there have been some studies uh, that have shown that about 30% of diarrhea related sickness in children can be reduced through hand washing um, and about 20% of respiratory sicknesses as well. Um, and also importantly, we're thinking about school settings, especially hand hygiene education has been shown to reduce absences by as much as 70%. Next slide. Um, and specifically, those absences were among middle school students. So we observed that uh, absence incidents decreased 25%, absences due to diarrhea decreased uh, by 57%. Um, there was also a study in 2001 among US Navy military recruits that found that when recruits were instructed to wash their hands at least five times a day, there were 45% fewer cases of respiratory illnesses during the two year period. Next slide. So I just wanna quickly leave you with uh, a slide and there'll be I'm sure in the slide deck uh, that's provided about resources that CDC and partners have promote hand hygiene um, and websites that could help if you're looking for any resources from us. Next slide. So we maintain a website dedicated to providing information on hand washing and the use of hand sanitizer at home and in community settings. Um, the website is cd.gov slash hand washing there at the top. Um, it provides guidance on when and how to wash hands, discusses the use of hand sanitizer when soap and water are not available for hand washing. Um, we also think it's important to provide people with the science behind our guidance. So we actually have a show me the science section that details all the evidence we have for various topics. Um, including the overall effectiveness of hand washing for protecting health, how to wash hands, how to use hand sanitizer, and reference to the literature that we're talking about. Um, we also have some training materials on there. Uh, and for our partners uh, who want to promote hand hygiene, we have health promotion materials that are free to download and can be used on websites, emails, and social media. Um, additionally, you'll have my email in this uh, presentation if you want to contact me or ask me questions but we maintain a website that is healthywater at cdc.gov. Um, that is another general place to ask questions around hand hygiene. And with that, I'll finish. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, David. And thank you for the cartoons. We love cartoons.
Okay, we um, thank you also to those of you who have submitted um, chat items. Um, David's presentation, especially some of this information about the reduction of illness that's been documented is very powerful. So thank you for that. And uh, CDC has some really good resources um, for you. Uh, thanks for the chat items. Annette said, touching and turning raw meat and not washing the fork before using again. Lisa said, cross-contamination, washing food in a hand-washing sink or in the bathroom. Hmm. Um, and Latendra said, what about cross-contamination with reusable bags? Those are all good points about cross-contamination. Okay, we are going to move forward with um, Akram to Mimi. Very glad to have him here. This is really interesting stuff about towels and cross-contamination. Um, he is a professor of practice in the Department of Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering at the University of Arizona. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Roger Williams University, Bachelor of Science in Biosystems Engineering from the University of Arizona, a Master's in Soil Mechanics and Foundations Engineering from Tufts University, and a PhD in Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering from the University of Arizona. We don't often have engineers as our guests, so this is exciting. Uh, Dr. Tamimi has traveled, worked, taught, and conducted research in many countries in Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and North America. He specialized in the development and evaluation of technologies to efficiently separate organic solids from water disinfect and beneficially reuse organic material, or organic residues, I'm sorry. Dr. Tamimi um, has a registered patent in the area of microbes disinfection of organic residuals, and he has three pending patents. He's published more than 25 peer-reviewed papers and more than 54 technical reports, and he currently serves on the editorial boards for three journals. He's served on review panels for governmental nonprofit and for-profit organizations and companies. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamimi, for being with us to uh, present this research um, from the University of Arizona. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we conducted a, a study in 2011, and um, the objectives were to determine the bacterial load found on household towels um, and bathrooms, um, towels in bathrooms and in kitchens for six major cities in North America. So that was the objective of the study. Next, please. So the six major cities were really um, different. Uh, they had you know, different, different temperatures, maximum temperature, average temperature, relative humidity. Uh, Chicago, Tucson, Arizona, New Orleans, uh, New York, uh, Orlando, and Toronto in Canada. And uh, we um, uh, had questionnaires for the households, and um, um, you know we asked the demographics, you know, how many people live there, uh, parents, children, presence of pets, uh, presence of children in the household, number of adult males and females, um, age of the towel in months and the frequency of washing of the towel in days per month. And we also asked the towel frequency of use um, and the last time the towel was, wa was washed in days. So we collected all this information. Uh, next, please. Next one, please. Um, so each bathroom and each kitchen towel was submerged in peptone broth to extract the bacteria. So after that, we used a stomacher bag to, with 500, or, with 500 mils or, or 250 mils of peptone broth. And that is really depending on the size of um, the, the, the towel. And that uh, uh, peptone broth was extracted and assayed. So we actually centrifuged it. We took it out. We took the, 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 the broth and we assayed it. We plated it. And um, newly purchased towels were soaked and tested at the same time as, as controls. So we had the control to see if there's a difference. 
Uh, each towel was tested for total bacteria. It was tested for coliforms, and it was tested for E. coli and MRSA. Next, please. So I'm going to talk about uh, the results from um, the, the bathroom towels and the kitchen towels separately. So uh, the first, uh, at the beginning, I'm going to talk about the bathroom towels. Next, please. Um, you know, I, I'm an engineer. I think in numbers, and I get numbers all the time, and I take a look, and I say, how can I present this data? So most of the time, I try to plot it. And if you look at this, this is for the um, HPC, which is heterotrophic uh, plate count, which is really the total uh, bacteria that is found. And uh, we use the CFU, which is a colony uh, forming unit, and those are the units. Uh, if you look at the, the sample ID, so we had you know about 80 samples for, for, from the towels or less. And um, those are ordered from the lowest count to the highest count. And we plotted them against that count. And if you look for the different cities, you know, it's, um, uh, you, can, you can see some pictures. You see, like in New Orleans, they have higher bacterial count. And New Orleans is mostly, uh, it's uh, high humidity. And you can actually justify why different cities have different counts. And next, please. This is for coliforms. Same thing, the towels, this is for coliforms. And again, New Orleans has the highest. Um, and um, you look at, you know, it's the same idea. It's giving you an idea about the count of uh, coliform in CFU per towel and uh, for the samples. So next, please. This is the E. coli. And um, if you look at this E. coli uh, for the bathroom towels, you will find out that there is a lot, you know, look at the numbers. Um, you know, one, and this is something I want to discuss later on. You know, when you see a one, that's really below detection limit. So when you run in this, if you have limited budget, you only can test them there and then, and you cannot keep the samples to see if you can have a real uh, reading on the plate. So what we, we, you know, microbiologists do, they say, well, it's less than one. So that's the detection limit while we were doing that. If you want to do further, you can actually assay or play that and uh, with a, a dilution and you can see you know, where, where you stand in, on, the particular, on the particular concentration of the bacteria. So there is a lot of less than one, meaning really it's below detection limit and we don't know what it is. When you do an analysis and or you want to show the information or you do any risk assessment, what you do, you just assume the upper limit, which is one uh, CFU per towel. And uh, next please. This is just, you know, showing the data. You're seeing the average, the standard deviation, the number of towels for each of the bacteria that we worked with, the HPC, the coliforms, the E. coli, those are the averages and the numbers for the data you just saw in the graphs for the HPC and the coliforms and the E. coli. And the variation in the number of towels between the different cities dependent on you know, what was available and uh, time allocation, et cetera, et cetera. Next, please. So this is the same data plotted. So if you take a look at the same data plotted for the bathroom towels, you would find out that you know there is you know New York you know between the different cities um, for the particular you know for the particular uh, pathogen for the particular bacteria count HPC coliforms E. coli it gives you an idea of what the table was presenting. Next, please. So the results for the kitchen towels are um, as follows. Next, please. So we have uh, concentration, the same thing. We, we did exactly the same thing for the kitchen towels. Uh, we plotted them. And if you look at um, the New Orleans ones, we have one, two, three, and four. So if you look at the kitchen towels, we have less numbers. Uh, the maximum number really was about 18. And they plotted the same thing, and you can look at, um, you know, it, it gives you the same idea, you know, uh, as the uh, bathroom towels. Next, please. 
for the color forms, this is the picture. You can see the picture for the color forms in, in the kitchen towels and um, the same idea. You get the same idea. Next, please. Another picture for the equal eye, and you see that it follows the same trend, and you have that one, which is really below detection limit. It's less, less than one, um, so we just take the upper limit, and we say it is one, and it is plotted. It follows the same, the same trend. Next, please. This is the statistics for the bacteria concentration on the kitchen towels, exactly as we did for the bathroom towels. And you look at the HPC, the coliforms, and the E. coli, and you look at the numbers, they really are a lot less um, in regard to the kitchen towels. And, um, you, know, our, you know, when this data was collected, one of the main concerns, a lot of people don't really have kitchen towels. Um, um, I mean, this is a cloth kitchen towels. They use, um, 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 you know, regular towels. I mean, I mean, disposable towels. So we were not able to collect them. This is one of the reasons you see a list number, and you see an average, and you see a standard deviation for each city. And if you look, we have here two, four, five cities. So one of the cities was really dropped. There was a, a problem. Um, uh, for for um, logistic problem that we were not able to to do it for that particular city. Next, please. So the same thing. If you look at this, the same data plotted. You can take a look and you see the difference between the cities for the three different um, bacteria: the HPC, the coliforms, and the E. coli. Next, please. So the conclusions, you know, for the kitchen towels are. Um, for the kitchen towels are as follows. Please, next please. We, you know, we had a number of questions for the kitchen towels. We had the same thing uh, for the bathroom towels, but, um, I'll, you know, we did not really see any dif significant difference. Um, but I'll come to that later on and I'm going to qualify my my statement so we asked the questions and we say is there a significant difference in bacteria concentration in kitchen towels between cities and for the different bacterials and you see a p-value um, a p-value is really a, it's a, it's for the ANOVA and the analysis of variance so we conducted an analysis of variance and you get a p-value and the rejection uh, the rejection area is, is 0 0.5 which means any number in the p-value that is less than 0 0.05 will uh, show that there is a significant difference. If it's above 0 0.05, that means there is no significant difference between whatever we are comparing uh, to, answer, to answer the question. So if you look here, you will you find out that there is significant difference in the kitchen towels between cities, the count, the bacterial count and concentration in kitchen towels between cities for the different the HPC, the coliforms, the E. coli, because the p-value is less than 0 0.05. Next, please. Then we asked uh, other questions, you know, and here are the questions for the bathrooms. You know, is there a significant difference between bacteria concentration in bathroom towels and kitchen towels? And you look at this, there is only a difference in the HPC, the, you know, the total the, the total bacterial count. And uh, the p-value is 0 0.0067, uh, but there isn't really in coliforms or E. coli. Next, please. Is there a significant difference between bacteria concentration in kitchen towels in the presence of pets? So if the house has pets, and it shows you that there isn't. The interesting thing, if you look at the E. coli, there is 0 0.08, and 0 0.08 is really very close to 0 0.05. And um, this is something um, that I will talk about a little later on, uh, because I made observations later on in other analysis that I conducted um, an analysis of variance for, statistical analysis of variance, and I'll come to that. So, in other words, there is really no significant difference between E. coli if you have Pets, if the, if the, you know, for in the kitchen towels for pets, if the pets exist in the household. Next, please. Is there a significant difference between bacterial concentration in kitchen towels when there are children in the house? 
and it shows you there isn't really in any in HPC, in coliforms, and E. coli. Next, please. Is there a significant difference between bacterial concentrations based on age of the kitchen towel? There is none. So the age of the kitchen towel, as long as, you know, it doesn't really play a factor. Next, please. Uh, is there a significant difference between bacterial concentration in kitchen based on frequency of washing? So how often do you wash it? If you look at E. coli, yes. The more you wash it, the less uh, count you have in the E. coli because you get a p-value of 0.14, which is less than 0.5. But for the total bacteria and the coliforms, there isn't really. Next, please. Is there a significant difference between bacterial concentration in kitchen towels based on frequency of use? Um, for the total coliform, of course, you know, we have more bacteria all of the hands as we wash, you know, the total bacteria. So there is uh, the HPC. So the more often you actually use it, the more bacteria you're going to have. So there is significant difference. But for coliforms and E. coli, they, there is a significant difference. Next, please. Is there a significant difference between bacterial concentrations and kitchen towel based on last time washed in date? So doesn't really matter when it was washed. Okay, so that's really what it's saying. But if you look at the p-value for the HPC, it's it's lower uh, for the HPC than coliforms. And um, this is something I'll talk about a little later on for the discovery I made that I will let you know uh, at the end, before at the end. Please next. So the conclusions for the bathroom towels, you know, next please. Um, is there a significant difference in bacterial concentration in bathroom towels between cities? There isn't really. And you know, the answer to that question, there isn't. And um, that's between, you know, for the bathroom towels between cities. And we didn't really see for the bathroom towels and significant difference between, you know, using the questions for, uh, you know, for, that I presented earlier, um, uh, you know, for pets, how, how often it was you were washed, et cetera, et cetera. Next, please. Is there a significant difference between bacteria concentrated in bathroom towels in the presence of pets? There isn't. Next, please. Um, you know, if there, you know, if there is, if there are children in the household. It, uh, you know, there is E. coli, E. coli is 0 0.025, so there is a difference dependent um, for, for the bathroom, for the bathroom towels, um, for the presence of E. coli. E. coli. Next, please. Is there a significant difference for the age of the towel, of the bathroom towel? Uh, no. So, next, please. Uh, there is a difference, um, you know, for the frequency of use in in uh, the total colorful the total bacterial count and um, the e coli the hpc and the e coli and you look at the p value so there is differences in the bathroom towels based on frequency of washing next please frequency of use um yes for hpc and for e coli next please for the based on last time it was washed in days it did not really matter, so there isn't any any difference if it was, you know, between the, the washing days, how often it was washed. Next, please. Uh, the age, you know, the age of the towel, uh, towel if washed only one day ago. Okay, this, this is a different question. Is there a significant difference between bacteria concentration in the bathroom towels if washed only one day ago? Uh, it made a difference, of course, in the HPC, 0 0.022, which is less than 0 0.05, but you know the E. coli again. We're getting you know it's uh, 0.076, so there is a question mark in regard to the E. coli. Next, please. Is there a significant difference between bacterial concentration in bathroom towels used by male versus female? And there isn't actually. Next, please. So, you know, I just want, before the, before the questions, I want to conclude with the following. I discovered, you know, this, this, this uh, experiment was run, this study was run in 2011, and between 2011 and 2019, I did a lot of statistical analysis in, in microbiology and bacterial and viral counts. Um, 
And I found out something really, really interesting. First of all, if you notice for the, for the, the kitchen towels, uh, um, I'm sorry for the, you know, the number of, um, the number of samples were not really high enough. Sometimes you have four, five, you had the maximum was, I believe, 18, less than 20. And that gives you an idea that, you know, we needed really more uh, towels, more samples to be done. The other thing that I discovered, um, you know, microbiologists, you know, it's known that um, when you do an analysis of variance, statistics on, on microbiological data, you take the, the log 10, you, can, you transform the data and you take the log 10 of the data and you run the analysis on the transformed data. And you just assume, they do that to assume that it is normally distributed. And they do all the analysis based on that. And most of the literature actually uses that. And there are some other things, you know, uh, uh, typical ways of transforming the data, assuming that it is being Trans, it is being normalized. And, you know, I'm an engineer, I think of numbers, so I decided to check for myself. And I found out that actually um, the data is not normally distributed when you take the log 10, especially when you have low count of the samples in the samples. And we have, you have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of data with um, uh, low detection limit. And um, I have um, been, since probably 2015, I have been really transforming the data in a different format, not to take in the log 10, I transform it by other means to get it to be normally distributed. I test it to be normally distributed. Then I do my analysis of variance and I make the conclusion and the inference about the data and do the publications. So the data that is presented you know, in this study you know, it's a little scoot, and I would love to go back and really transform the data in a different way to make sure that it is normally distributed. And this is true because there's a lot of the p-values that are really close to 0 0.05. So, you know, this is interesting. Um, the results are valid, but we can actually, I would love to find them time and maybe a little funding to, re to go back and look at this data uh, one more time and make sure that it is normally distributed and make um, the inferences and the conclusions. I'll stop here and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanini. All right, we have a number of questions for both of you and um, we are running out of time. So I'm going to go right into the questions and uh, some of these we might need to address through an email. Um, let's see. Here's a question for David. There's a, some very good ones, but one I was also curious about um, is from Maureen. How can it best be addressed that bar soap can cause cross-contamination? I guess she's saying can the bar soap could be contaminated. Is that something, David, you have any insight on? Yeah, so we get uh, we get this question a little bit about um, we don't because we're thinking about hand hygiene generally. We're um, not looking as much at um, uh, at other at kitchen settings specifically, but I know in general um, there have been some studies that have you know shown that um, bar soap or even liquid soap, if improperly used, has some uh, microbes or contamination in it. Um, and the question is really, as you said, it, it's does that get somewhere else? And so from a hand washing perspective, um, we don't have data that says really that if it gets on your hands and then you're still washing them and then um, they're coming and, and drying them and washing them properly, that it's staying in your hands afterward. From a cross-contamination standpoint in the kitchen, I can see what you're talking about in terms of um, contamination living in the soap dish or something like that. And so that's where um, we don't uh, have guidelines on that specifically, at least my group, um, but I could check and see in terms of uh, our, um, since I'm in the division of waterborne, foodborne, and environmental, we have foodborne colleagues just across all that I could ask about that also. Okay, good. They're right there. Um, and then one more quick question. Um, Nicole asked, where could she find the study about the um, hand hygiene reducing school absences? 
Uh, that will be on our cdc.gov um, slash handwashing website under the show me the science um, and then there are references there that you can follow um, and if you can't find it or if it's not up there for some reason it should definitely be up there because I pulled it from it but if it's not then send me an email and I can send you those references also. Okay terrific thank you that was really good information. Um, Akram I have a question for you. Hieronymus okay. asked, how did you decide with which pathogens to test for? Why not Salmonella, Campylobacter, et cetera? Um, multiple reasons. Um, you know, I, I need to let you know that this was really, um, most of the work that we do, it's funded by the industry. And uh, we do uh, proof of concept. So this is really a proof of concept for a particular company and um, they usually ask us to look at particular uh, pathogens at particular bacteria or viruses there we have studies that we did in uh, for for viruses and uh, um, and other and other bacteria now one of the factors because you doing you doing it on the road you're not really doing it at, at in Tucson at the University of Arizona there are you know bacteria that you really cannot test unless it's in the lab and if you ship it you know the the you know the, the holding time is is very limited and you will not be able to test it appropriately like uh, uh, salmonella and uh, so those are the two reasons we why we did not for in this particular study look at that so really the the, the protocol was def defined by the funding um, entity and this is what we done at the time and but it can be done you know in co collaboration with you know other university labs so you are you know if you are in New York you can collaborate with the university there and do the testing there and without you know shipping without uh, affecting the results but that would be a little more expensive and it, it, it needs more logistics and collaboration between the two you know University of Arizona and the other uh, institutions okay Yes, thank you. Uh, great questions. You all have some good questions. Um, David, this is for you, and I'm curious about this too. <clears throat> Laura asks, what does research say is the best way to dry hand, specifically paper towels versus air dryers, which is, of course, the choices we're offered in most public restrooms. Uh, what can you say about that or a resource for Laura? Uh, that is a very good question, <laughs> and one that we are uh, that we are looking into. Um, the as far as we know, we don't have anything that says that paper towels or hand dryers are one is better than another um, in either in these settings, or one that we don't have any evidence that would lead us to um, make a statement on one being better than another from that standpoint. Um, I will say that the consideration is also about um, how well you use the product. And so I know, as we many of us do, that um, if you're not if you're frustrated and taking a while with that hand dryer that takes a really long time and you don't get your hands dry, um, we do have data that says that uh, that. Um, moist hands or wet hands will collect more microbes than uh, than dry hands so we want you to have your hands fully dry um, but in terms of the methods if you're using them properly both are fine or equal as far as we've seen um, anecdotally I will say that I was just sent uh, by one of my colleagues a very interesting article in Guardian that went into the history of some of this that um, I can send to you, Shelley, that I, I haven't looked into the resources behind it, but I found it a very interesting read from the industry standpoint, something that we don't get into in, in the government side, but um, interesting in the history of it. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, we'll have to take one more question, and I actually am not sure, uh, I don't want to put it in the spot, but this is something I uh, would be curious to look into, and maybe, Akram, you can answer this. Uh, this is from Renee, who asked, should towels be washed washed with bleach? If so, does color safe bleach have the same effect as I assume she's saying liquid bleach? 
It, you know, if, if it's washing the bleach, it's, uh, there's a better chance of really killing the bacteria. Um, and uh, um, the diff you know, it depends on the concentration, of course. And uh, there are studies um, done on, you know, bleach and non-bleach, and bleach is very effective. In, in killing bacteria and um, and viruses, but bleach does not really kill, um, you know, uh, parasites. So um, that's really what I can tell to say about it. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much for all these great questions. Uh, we're going to go to wrap up, and I want to encourage you again both to uh, respond to the post survey. Um, also, we will do some follow-up with some of these resources. So next slide, please. We've got some more events to tell you about and a few wrap-up things that will be of interest to you. So some of you may have heard that World Food Safety Day has been recognized by the FAO and the WHO um, on June 7th. And I wanted to just tell you that we are planning a Twitter party for that day where we want all of you to come and say, what do you do to support people in their efforts to reduce the risk of food poisoning? So please join our Twitter party. That's going to be at 1 o'clock Eastern on June 7th. And watch your email because we have, are launching a whole uh, mini my, micro website for you for World Food Safety Day. So you have everything you need to talk about World Food Safety Day with your local media and uh, social media, et cetera. So that's coming out very soon. Um, part two of this Clean Summit will be on June 12. We're going to talk about surface cleaning and we're going to talk about sanitizing. We're going to talk about the differences between cleaning and sanitizing. Um, we did not get into sponges here because I wanted to confirm some information. So we might throw something about sponges in there. But the registration is open for June 12. So go to fightback.org slash events and you'll find the link. Uh, next slide. Again, on the CEUs, download your certificate right now or look for the follow-up email or go on to our recordings. Okay, um, that's where you also will get the deck. So some of you asked, we will put a PDF of the deck there also. Next. Survey will pop up immediately when we close here. And I want, I'd love you to give us your feedback. Next. And we have many, many resources on hand washing also at fightback.org in addition to all the terrific stuff CDC has. So please check out these things. We have some special to babies and toddlers. Um, we had some great presentations at our recent consumer food safety education conference about high-speed hand washing and how you can use it in classroom. Next. Our work is supported by some generous and very committed uh, organizations and companies that want to see uh, health and food safety educators succeed and understand how hard you work to make sure people don't get sick. So. This is a shout out to our community connectors, Cargill, PMA, Costco, Wholesale, FMI Foundation, and Nestle, and all these other terrific donors who support these webinars. And next, we also have a set of partners who really allow for the partnership to, I don't know, do everything we do, everything from our website, our emails, uh, their support is critical to making sure we uh, can serve backbiters in the public. And I want to call out Cargill, FMI Foundation, NSF, PMA, and Tyson for their support. The partner next slide shows you all the partners who are part of the partnership. It is quite a impressive group of scientific and professional organizations, corporations, associations, we partner with the federal agencies. Uh, we get terrific cooperation and support. <laughs> and speakers like David who was with us today, so we thank them uh, for the support. Next. And just a big thank you to David, to Akram, to 
all of you who came today curious about this topic. Uh, we really want to do more to serve you on the topic of clean, and um, I would urge you to be on the June 12th um, event where we'll dig deeper into this issue for cleaning and sanitizing. Um, thanks to our speakers. We really appreciate the time you've given us today. And with that, we will wrap up. Thank you for being here and check out the recording on the website. Bye-bye.